Yes, we made it. We've invited him. And he's here. I can feed him. Nothing 
tonight we're going to have a testimony from a brother Delvin. He's going to explain to us. He's going to tell us his account and his experience with Jesus and how it was saved. Evening, church. Everybody good? Yeah. Can I hear you? Everybody good? Yeah. Let me start. So, I'm not here to impress you, but I'm here to impress on you that Jesus is real. And I know he's real because I've gone through some battles. But I got saved over 30 years ago. My claim to fame is I was born opposite Wembley Stadium. And then by the age of two, I moved to Subway. So, I'm, I'm a Wembley fan. So, in, in, in my lifestyle before, all I was interested in was sex, drugs, reggae music, and roller skating. That was my life. So, me turning around and um, accepting Jesus in my heart, it was a big thing. And uh, God had passed the and witnessed the me with um, Pastor Harry at Royal State. And uh, they told me that, you know, Jesus is real. And I was like, yeah, right. And then I went to church and bowed my knee and accepted Christ into my life. And I haven't turned back since. And I, I've kept going. So at that present time, I was like happy. Because I had this peace. I don't know if you guys have felt it before. It's a peace that is beyond all understanding. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't, I couldn't understand, I just knew I had a, this peace. You know I, mean? I remember leaving the church and walking away and said, these people are crap. I'm getting back here again. That was my first reaction. And then I went to my friend's house and gave me a spliff and I felt sick. I said, you know what? I've got to go back to that church. Something's happened. And then I remember giving up my alcohol and that two weeks later. It took a bit longer because it had a big struggle with me. And I never I had to make a decision to let it go. Anyway, I had to speed up because time's going to run out of me. Um, I carried on living and get myself involved in the things of God. And the scripture that kept coming up was seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness should be added to you. That was quoted so many times when the times when you felt like not going to church, you felt this, you felt that. I just kept quoting that and we kept going. And um, let's, I'm going to have to give you the overview because of time. I, um, Luke, apologies about my wife not being here. Unseen circumstances, it's just me. It's meant to be me and my wife. But anyway, um, in that time, I, uh, I, I got married, and um, happy, uh, she had two kids, I went with her as a stepfather to her two kids, and that time I was about 25 years old, and uh, during that time, about, you know, we was getting on to a certain extent, and then in that year, things started to get rocky, as you know, some of you probably experienced in the first year. And uh, we've been single-mindedness and all that kind of stuff. I, I came to a point where I said, you know what? Let's just take a little break. I don't believe I should have made that decision at that time. I believe it was the wrong choice. So I'm not encouraging that anyway. But I said, look, let me just take a break from it. The house and everything else like that. And I took this break. And in that time, she wandered off with another man. Just take a break. And uh, I, my head, everything, I was just so, so distressed about the whole thing and I'm saying, God, why me? Why has this happened? And um, I turned around and I forgave her. We looked to read inside, started off reading inside, and then she told me she's pregnant for the guy. And I, uh, that was it. I said, that's it. We're done. Can't finish. Just got a simple base. And that's what happened. And then um, within the space of another four years, the time growing up on that. I met this beautiful woman in church. She's standing next to me here right now. Yeah, so I, met this, I met this beautiful woman in church and uh, actually proposed to her in church. And um, it was the end of a, a revival. And uh, she said yes. And uh, we've been married for 24 years now. 
trying, kept trying to try and build that father and son relationship with him. And um, 2004 came, and uh, he, uh, he was ganged up on. He was uh, beaten up, stabbed in the heart, shot in the back, and thrown in the river Brent. Again, devastated. Phone call came to me at 2 30 in the morning, totally devastated. I dropped on the stairs and cried my eyes out. And I had, I had kept saying, Why God? Why me? Why me? Why is this happening to me? And I dropped on the stairs and cried my eyes out. I had kept saying, God turned to me. Why God? Why directed me and said, Look, why is this to where they found him? And I went to where they found him by the river, Brent of Greenford, opposite the Gulf Links. And I went down on my knees. I raised my hand like this. And I said, Lord, I forgive those who have done this to my son. And I meant every word. And I'll tell you something. From my feet right up to my head, I felt this release. Because before that, it was I'm going on the road. I find out he did this to my son. I'm gonna call up the man then. So we're gonna deal with this. But if I'm gonna make a stand, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna live for Christ. We say the Lord's prayer all the time. He says, forgive those who have done wrong. So I had to put Christ first. I had to put the word of God first in that situation. I did it. And I'm I'm telling you, I was set free. From vengeance. My case is still going on now. Seventeen years later, I was still haven't gone and sold. Again, I asked God why. But then God showed me. He was like a. You're gonna make it sound like it's crazy, but it, it was a test in time for my faith. And you put God first. I managed to get the strength to live for my wife and the other kids that we have in the house. Um, my wife had two children when I met her, so I became stepfather to two of the two kids. And then we had our two kids. Um, I had to be there, I had to stand strong and be the man and do what's right. I'm not saying that this perfect person. I'm saying, I'm saying, I still got the baptism now. But I can say to you, put Jesus first through everything. God will, God will keep you, He'll guide you. So you must put the Word of God first. You must seek Him first. And as time goes on, you will see that Jesus is real. So time went on, my dad. Was sick. Again, rushed to the hospital. My dad died in front of me as well. My dad left when I was two. I never had a proper relationship with my dad. And, uh, you know, he went peacefully at that. And uh, during the time when he was alive, he, he, he um, had a stroke and became paralyzed. So for the last 10 years before he died, I was visiting in a hole at the time. And showing him that I love him, and telling him to his face that I love him. Because in doing that, I had a breakthrough of the past, not going on to my children, not going into the circle. And uh, again, through the word of God, God helped me to do that. Today, stand here and say that no one can tell me no one I stand here and say I stand here and say that no one can tell no one can tell me no one Jesus is real if you put into action what his word says he will guide you and move into the direction where you need to go and like I said, I'm not perfect, but 
in those battles that I've gone through, that Jesus showed, showed up. And all I had to do was put him first. Happily married now, with my wife, kids, they're older now. They have to be doing what you lot are doing with the babies and doing all the nappy changes and all that kind of stuff. So none of that for us. So we're, we're kind of like at a position in our lives where we're, we're going on now. We still do the fostering. We have uh, free use from the YMCA at our house. And it's, it's, it's a joy to serve God. And I encourage you tonight, give Jesus a chance in your life.
parts of you guys back there, you have to give me a shout. Yeah. Yeah. Come on a bit louder than that. Yeah. Amen, amen. Listen, I just want to, I can give these guys a round of applause, but it's not going to be enough. Can you guys just give these guys just a round of applause? You know, obviously we just had a praise and worship night, you know, and um, I don't know if you agree with me, but there is, there's just something special about praise and worship. You know, there's just something supernatural about it. You know, often people, they won't come to church, but they'll put on praise and worship. You know, when we sing on the streets, oftentimes people will stop and they would applaud, but they won't accept the gospel, but they love gospel music. And what I've come to realize is that when we sing, when we praise, when we lift up the name of Jesus Christ, it gets God's attention. You see, God gets involved. The book of Psalms, many of us know the book of Psalms, but Psalms 22, it's a song by David, the King David. And Psalms 22 verses 3 tells us that God abides in the praises of his people. And what that means is, is that when we sing, when we lift up our voice, when we praise God, God gets involved. God comes down. So what you're feeling right now is that God is here because his people are praising him. But one of the most powerful things about praise and worship is beyond the fact that God gets involved is it takes our minds off our issues. You see, many of us in this place tonight might be battling with things. There might be things that we're going through, only things that we know. But often when I'm battling with something, you know, I can't pray, if I'm honest with you. Sometimes I don't even feel like coming to church. But one thing I can do is just put my praise and worship song on my everything changes. Because God is abiding with me in that moment. Psalms 22, as I said to you before, was a song that David wrote at a time when David himself was going through the most pain and anguish. He was on the run. People after his life he was hiding in caves, he was desperate. And the interesting thing was that David wrote a song, a praise and worship song to God. He called out to God. You see, instead of David running from God, David ran to God. And he made this song, Psalms 22. I just told you verse three of that. But the interesting thing, church, and what I wanna get your attention tonight, today is called Good Friday. And as my brother Andrea kinda gave us some some knowledge about what Good Friday is, and we're going to go into that. But on Friday, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was on the cross. He was in the most pain that none of us would ever imagine. He was beaten, he was bloodied, his beard was ripped from his face, he had a, a thorn dug into his head. He had nails driven through his hands, driven through his feet. And in that moment, Matthew and Mark recalls that Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And many people looked at Jesus in that moment and they said to him, his God has left him. But you know what Jesus was doing? In that moment of great, great anguish and pain, Jesus was calling out to his father. But you know what Jesus was actually doing? He was singing Psalms 22. I just want to read something for you quickly. See, Psalms 22 is not just verses three. I just want to read this to you. Bear in mind, this is written 1,000 years before Jesus Christ. And in his greatest time of pain, church, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
That's how it started, church. Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift up my voice, but I find no relief. Yet you are wholly enthroned in the praise of Israel. That's verses 3. Our ancestors trusted in you, and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and never disgraced. But I am a worm and not a man. I am scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and they shake their heads, saying, Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb and you led me to trust in you. Trust at my mother's breast. I will trust into your arms at my birth. I was thrust into your arms at my birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. Do you not stay so far from me for trouble is near and no one else can help me. My enemies surround me like a herd of bulls. Fierce bulls of Bashan has helped me in. Like lions, they open their jaws against me, roaring and tearing into their prey. My life is poured out like water. This is Psalms 22. A thousand years before Jesus, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and lift me from the death me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs and evil gang close on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and glow. They divide my garments among themselves and cast lots for my clothing. O oh Lord, do not stay far away. You are my strength. Come quickly to my aid. Save me from the sword. Spare my precious life. Snatch me from the jaws of the lion. I proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but he has listened to their cries for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows, vows in the presence of those who worship you. This is Psalms 22, written a thousand years before Jesus was born. And on that cross, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus himself, in his most desperate time, sang a song of praise to God. And I believe that in that moment, the presence of God came and comforted Jesus. And so, as we stand here 2,000 years later, I want to say to you, if you're in this place, Jesus knows what you're going through. If you're in this place, Jesus has already been there. Pierce his hands and his feet. He knows what it is to feel pain. He knows what it is when you are in anguish and when you're in pain and when you need help because he's been there himself. He's tasted it himself so he understands. And I want to say to you, if you're in this place, today is Good Friday for a reason because there's good news. And you don't have to go through the same thing that Jesus did. All you have to do is call out to him, my God, my God. My God, my God. Whatever you're going through tonight, I don't know. But what I do know is a God in heaven that desperately loves and cares for you so much that he was willing to lay down his life. And if you're in this place and you're not born again, you know, I can't really see you. You know, all I see shadows and faces looking back at me. But I know that God sees you. And I know that God sees whatever you're going through. I know that God sees your heart and I know that God cares. And I want to invite you to get to know the God that they always spoke of. I wanted to get you to know the God that we all sang about. I want to get you to know the God that we all sang in praise. Because he loves and he cares for you. And with that said, can I just have every head bowed and every eye closed in the presence of God? See, Jesus loves you. That's what I'm going to say. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. The Father loves you and the Holy Spirit loves you. 
And if you're in this place and you never experienced love, I'm telling you that God loves you. And there is hope for you tonight. You see, if you're not sure of where you're going to go when you die, today is a day to get right. The Bible says that today is a day of salvation. What that means is that you can get yourself right with that God. See, if you were to die today, where would you go? Would you even know? You see, the Bible says that's appointed to a man to die once and then come to judgment. Look at the world that we live in, there's madness. Tomorrow is not even guaranteed. But I want to say to you that you can leave this place with a security. You can leave this place knowing that your soul is guaranteed. You can leave this place knowing that, you know what? If I was to die tonight, just like that thief on the cross, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. And I want to tell you, all you have to do is lift up your hands. All you have to do is say a simple prayer to acknowledge your sin before God and God will forgive you. If you're in this place and that's you, if you're online and you're listening, listen, Jesus loves you. I can't see your hand, but listen, God can see. And all I want to say is, if that is you, just raise your hand, raise it to God, raise your heart to God. But just repeat after me, say, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, God, I thank you that you have saved me. Sorry, God, I thank you that you have died for me. God, I know that I'm a sinner. God, I know that if I was to die today, hell would be my home. But I know that if I was to confess my sins, you will forgive me. And God, forgive me of my sins. God, I turn away from my sins. And I turn to you. God, forgive me. And come into my life. See, if you said that prayer, and you mean it, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. And I'm going to let you know that you are saved. If you anything was to happen today, you are saved. to the Christians listen let's glorify Jesus to those that have given their lives and that's what it means when you say the sinner's prayer the Bible says that heaven is worshipping heaven is rejoicing say the angels right now are rejoicing you see um, we're called the potter's house you know you can talk to myself my name's Nafferty or maybe we're one of the guys you know, afterwards, just to find out a bit more about us. You know, maybe they say the prayer today, I do not know. But you can talk to us after. You know, we meet here on, a, on Sundays at one o'clock in the Sudbury Methodist Church, not Methodist, but Pentecostal. But I just want to let you know that Jesus Christ loves you. If one thing you will leave this message today is that Jesus Christ loves you and he died for you. And there's hope in Jesus Christ. I just want to invite the musician Andrea just to sing another song of worship. Yes, how many of you enjoyed tonight? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How many of you had an encounter with Jesus tonight? Yeah. Yes, we're going to rejoice uh, this very night with this one last song, Trading My Sorrow.
being forsaken. And the truth is, none of us are forsaken because in the book of Matthew, he says, Lord, I'm with you all the time. Now, there are people here going through issues of life. You're going through things. Just issues of life. I had to bow my eyes closed for one moment. Just a respect to God for those around you. You know, one of the things you, what we what we don't want to do is walk out of this place the same way you walked in. To walk out this place not receiving Jesus. You know, on the calendar, this would be, in fact, one of the biggest days in Christianity. Not, you know, we think about East, uh, Christmas, the birth, but the death of Christ, it has to be the biggest thing that's ever happened on planet Earth. It doesn't matter what some people say, the whole world, clock, time is set because it's the biggest day on planet Earth. No other day conquers this day. This day is not about looking for missing Easter eggs, bunnies. We have this opportunity when Easter gets comes around, people become just a touch religious. But it's the biggest day the biggest miracle in all of life, the biggest miracle, undisputed miracle, undisputed, scientists, scholars, undisputed, we all know that Jesus came. We all know he died. And this square couple of meters in the garden of Gethsemane, they still can't find the bones. That means Jesus is alive. And if he has resurrected and he's alive, he's your living hope. And all of this today all what we've done is so you can get to know him. That he is your way. Now with your heads bowed and eyes closed, no one moving around. This is not to embarrass you. If you are here not if you know about him, but do you know him as your personal Lord and your Savior? If you were to pass from this life and stand, could you say, God, I know you. I spoke to you. You're my redeemer, you live. Could you say that? See, salvation is the word salvage, where he's come to rescue you. Tonight is your opportunity. And you may say, preacher, I don't know him, but tonight I'm going to walk out of this place. I want to know him. Doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. Let's just deal with today. No matter what happens, I want to know you right now. And the heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and you say, That's me. Would you pray for me? Would you remember your prayer? Slip up your hands. Just slip it up and slip it straight back down. Just slip it up and slip it down. We can have a wonderful privilege to pray for you. Front to back, left to right, all over this place. Just one call, one more call. You don't know him. Say, pray for me. Quickly, just slip it up. 
slipping straight back down and you're down on the bridge. Front to back. Not to embarrass you. There are people online, people tuning in online. You don't know him. An opportunity for you. Quickly. Before we change the world of the service. Let me encourage you. Tomorrow, sorry, Sunday, right here, we have our service here. Sunday, one o'clock. We want to encourage you this Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Don't let the quilt tie you down.